What can I do? Keep an eye on Myra Lance for me. Uh Uh-huh, yes. I left her in the cottage. Dan Eagle may be only half finished with what he started. I'll do my best. You can count on that, sir. Okay, I'm going up to the office at the lodge now and find out if anyone saw Danny leave the grounds. I'll see you. Marlowe, did you get enough story material from the box fighters? For a couple of novels, Clementine. You alone here? Well, I am now. My daddy and I were playing canasta, but he left a while back. Went off without his coat, too, see? Ah, uh, I know. You've been here in the office ever since, huh? Why, um, yes. Why? Well, maybe you can help me. <gasps> did you... Gladly. But you've just got to help me first, Mr. Marlowe. Have you got a cigarette paper? A cigarette paper? Mm-hmm, you know, the makings. I'm oh. trying to roll me a cigarette, ran out of mine. I found my daddy's tobacco, and then I absolutely emptied his coat pockets here looking for a paper, but there wasn't any. You wouldn't happen to no, have it. No, 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 I'm afraid not, Clementine. Oh. Here, have one of mine. They, oh. in fact, have two. Oh. Now, my question, huh? Did you happen to see Danny Eagle go out the... Go out? Out the what, Mr. Marlowe? Huh? Oh, uh, never mind. Listen, Clementine, did this thing come out of your daddy's coat pocket, too? That old ticket stub? Yeah. Huh? Out of that little pocket in the big one on the right side, it was... Well, Mr. Marlowe, what's wrong? I don't know. But I better find out right now. As I ran out of the office and passed the empty rope ring toward where the cabin stood, I was full of the conviction that Clover Lake training camp was due for a second corpse any minute. Only this time I knew that some fast adjectives I myself had tossed off and not a hot-headed fighter were playing cause and effect. As I made for the door of the Lance cabin, there was no help in the fact that my volunteer guard, Jess Weatherwax, was nowhere in sight. I called Myra's name twice and still got no answer. So I stepped back to go to work on the door with my shoulder when the lock turned from inside. What? What is it, Marlowe? What are you doing here? At the moment, Myra, baby, I'm counting lucky stars, the kind that kept you hale and hearty in spite of me and my big mouth. I'm... I'm afraid I I don't know what you mean. I mean I almost spilled all, including the clincher, which was where you could be located. All this, mind you, to the guy who no doubt was in it with Lance right up to his Adam's apple. The fact that you're still breathing means that he must have given up and beat it because as a topper I sent him here to guard you. You... Say, what's the matter? Aren't you even curious? Why... Why, yes, sure, of course. So am I, Marlowe. Oh, don't move. Oh, no. You have a talent for stupid audacity, young man. Myers still breathing because up to the point where you knocked on this door, she still didn't realize my connection. But when you showed up, I couldn't take a chance. I was forced to bring uh, this gun into things and wait behind the door. Now, obviously, you both know. And I was so relieved you still had strength enough to open the door, Myra. I stepped in chin first and was happy about it. Well, I... I, I... I was afraid to warn you. Well, it's your move, Weatherwax. What'll it be? I have no choice. What? You'll have a lot of bodies to crawl out from under, Buster. It won't be too hard. Dan is already framed for Raleigh's murder. Framed by whom? By Raleigh Lance himself. Such a simple little plan. I worked it out as I've worked out everything else around here. Uh, Just for the record, how is it supposed to go? Once Myra knew about Raleigh, she became dangerous to me. She had to be killed. So I told him how to set up the whole thing. You know, you're really enjoying yourself, aren't you? Frankly, no. Or I just don't intend to take the rap for my late partner's stupid clumsiness. Oh, but this has gone far enough. Babe, look out, he's got a gun! (laughs) Duck, Myra! boy, Phil. He lost his gun. And I still got a good right hand! My boy ain't gonna be framed for nothing! Babe, hey, stop it. I'm gonna fix this guy. Go, go. Lay off, babe, will you? Lay off. Lay off, I tell you. Lay off. Okay. He's gotta tell us the rest. Come on, where the wax talk. What actually happened on the path to the lake? Well? Lance set up the frame on Danny as I told him to. By planting that eagle tie clasp at the weak spot in the rail. And then he he made a lot of marks on the path. Like there'd been a fight. Go ahead. And after that, he went over to kick the rail loose. He tripped and he fell. All because of those shoes of his with the hard, slick soles and and built-up heels. Silly little man. (laughs) 
Well, it wasn't long until the boys from the sheriff's office arrived with a good doctor, a lot of open notebooks, and an endless supply of questions. But finally, all the pieces were fitted together. <laughs> the very surprised Danny Eagle, who had done a lot of thinking, was back from a second long walk. And the whole thing had boiled down to me alone at the bedside of a heavy-jawed trainer. Who had a happy look on his ugly puss for the first time that night. Our boy's going to be champ now, Marlowe, thanks to you. Oh, thanks to you, babe. <laughs> we were almost down for the count when you showed up. Hey, how's the shoulder? That's nothing. Hey, look, tell me something. How'd you back old Weatherwax into that corner? Oh, well, I found a ticket stub from his coat pocket with a number A2 on it. Weatherwax claimed that he'd never seen a fight or met Lance until the camp opened up here. But that stub proved that just a month ago, he sat right beside Lance. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Lance always had seat A1 at the arena. Check. In short, Weatherwax was a liar who dropped his guard. And in this racket, you do that just once and you're out. Yeah. Hey, see that the eagle keeps his guard up, will you, babe? <laughs> I'm going to be betting on him from now on. Don't give it another thought. Good night, Phil. And I didn't give it another thought. Neither did I think about an arrogant little guy whose phony heels and twisted mind had dumped him into his own trap. Or about a fat gambler who traded in perverted victories and rotten, hopeless defeats. Instead, I thought about the sun coming up over the hills. And a nice big platter with a ham omelet on it. And then a good, solid eight hours sleep. Nothing else. You know, sometimes I think I have no soul. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Gerald Moore can currently be seen starring in Republic's The Blonde Bandit. Featured in our cast tonight were Joan Banks, Barney Phillips, Wilms Herbert, Howard McNear, Elliot Reed, Frank Gerstle, and Anne Morrison. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time a nervous breakdown in a driving rain. A cape with a high color and a tiny sliver of glass led me from the ballet and a beautiful dancer to the edge of a cliff and death. <laughs> A few months ago, our newspapers and magazines were full of articles and pictures showing the progress we've made during the first half of the 20th century. That progress, brought about by the American way of doing business, means that today we enjoy the highest standard of living of any nation in the world. We can keep our standards high, and we can increase the benefits for all of us by continuing to produce efficiently under a free economic system. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Pursuit, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where Burns and Allen are heard every Wednesday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System.